Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just do some bits and pieces here. Hey Dion, how are you doing, buddy? Rich Saranga Solomon Douglas. I said I'm going to come on earlier tonight uh, to just devote some time to the old wind, wind rush and uh, see how we can go from there. So normally it's 10 o'clock, but uh, I choose to do earlier time of 9 o'clock tonight. <clears throat> And, I, and I'm hoping to get um, Rachel a color. Hopefully that I can get her on tonight. <clears throat> and I think I've got Rachel on tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to, tonight we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about the Windrush, Windrush saga, uh, we call it saga, we call it scandal, we call it opportunity or whatever, we're going to call it something tonight and uh, I think a few days ago I was supposed to have Rachel Akela on to sort of look at this whole um, issue. And uh, because they got the legal implications as well. Um, right now, I just got someone, literally, Rachel, goes right and say, I have a brother and a sister that was deported from the UK, leaving their families behind. What can they do to get back there? I have been watching your program. Wow. Well, anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, uh, Rachel, I think we start having your questions already. Device is ready to <laughs> Uh, well, anyhow, good evening, Rachel. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. I'm fine. Good, good, good. Well, um, thank you for, for the short notice because after watching um, Amber Rudd uh, last night, uh, yesterday, and after watching the program tonight with uh, Mr. Lamy, um, the Channel 5, I think you have some people in this world who don't have television, so they are really free. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, watching on the replay. <laughs> I watched on replay, you know, <laughs> and and uh, so I, I, I said, uh, let me just come on early tonight and really deal mm. with the wind rush thing. And uh, and just as, as I said a while ago, while while we're just online a while ago, someone just actually messaged me a while ago about the whole thing, and I believe they are online as well. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, Silver and Sidian here on the late one, and I've got my guest Rachel O'Connor, she's a solicitor and deal a lot with immigration and um. And this thing, and she's going to give us some sort of spotlight on on the whole thing. But before we go there, I just want to um, set the stage because I'll do a little, a little um, because study a bit for a moment a while ago, and I just want to set the stage regarding the the wind rush. Like, who are the wind rush generation? And it says those arriving in the UK between 1948 and 1971 from Caribbean countries have been labelled the wind rush generation. This is reference to the ship MV Empire Windrush, which arrived at Tilbury, Dock, Essex on 22nd of January of June, sorry, 1948, bringing workers from Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago and other islands as a response to post-war labor shortages in the UK. The, the ship carried 492 passengers, many of them children. I didn't know that. Many of them were children. Yes, um, come yeah, on. Well, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so Commonwealth migrants arrived in the UK before 1971 to 2017 estimate of current population, non-UK national 57,000, more likely to be affected, UK nationals unlikely to be affected. Uh, Jamaica, it was 15,000, India 13,000, others 29,000, total 27,000, 57,000, including Pakistan, Kenya, and South Africa. It is unclear how many people belong to the Windrush generation since many of those who arrived as children traveled on parents' passports 
and never applied for travel documents, but they are thought to be in their thousands. There are now 500,000 people resident in the UK who were born in a Commonwealth country and arrived before 1971, including the Windrush arrivals, according to estimates by Oxford U University Migration Observatory. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Dion Green, Lorna Robinson, um, Donna Crooks, Darian William, Donna Crooks. So, Rachel, good evening. Good evening. What's, yeah. yeah, what's your, what's your view? What's <laughs> with this, um, the, the saga? I mean, we're in news, but what's your take on everything, Rachel? Well, I think it was a long time coming, really, um, because the hostile in immigration environment that has been created by successive governments, but compounded by this recent government, it has to say, um, albeit in a coalition, um, and it had to come to pass in this way because the climate couldn't go unchallenged and unchecked because too many people have been suffering in this way um, based on what the hostile climate has, has been delivering for people. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and you know, one, one of the things that um, many people are saying is this, uh, and I have been talking about this thing for a few years now with the former British, I, former Jamaican High Commissioner to the UK, which is Aluna Samba. And even before mm -hmm. that person, I've been talking about that, whereby persons get caught up. We only know of it when someone goes away to the Caribbean and then they try to come back and it's all in the news saying they can't come back because of their paperwork and everything. At the same time, there was this issue about, many people say, if you come before 1971, you're British, period. So therefore, uh, and, and, there, and there's something which, which was set out earlier, which I read, and it says, there was a 1948 British Nationality Act, which effectively gave all Commonwealth people coming here the right to stay permanently. It's absolute and stronger than indefinite leave to remain, as you cannot be deported even after going to prison. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I, that's what I that's what I wrote, isn't it? So um, yes, yeah, I'm using your words. Yes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, basically, I mean, you started off absolutely correctly by saying who are the Windrush generation. So the Windrush generation are people who came to the UK from the Commonwealth between 1948. Yeah. to the 1st of January 1973 and the Empire Windrush as you say came was started touring around the world heading towards the motherland being the United Kingdom and picking up lots of different people along the way including Caribbean people but other people from around the world and at that time in order to deal with this influx of people literally arriving by the boatload um, the United Kingdom um, put together the British Nationality Act 1948 giving yeah. these people the right to be British when they landed here. Yes. Unfortunately, what's happened is there's been different laws, um, the Commonwealth Act in particular, in the 60s, there was two Commonwealth Acts, which started to restrict the Britishness of the people who arrived here. And then you have the 1971 Immigration Act, which was enforced on the 1st of January 1973. And yeah. that's why people will see the Home Office um, literature referring to if you have been here from before the 1st of January 1973, then it's highly likely that you'll be able to stay here. So those people during that period were effectively British people. Yes. Um, and they don't need indefinite leave to remain. I know that uh, what stories that I'm seeing, the Home Office has given such people indefinite leave to remain. But in fact, there may need to be some other... Um, guarantee for, of their right to reside here, but indefinitely to remain is kind of um, trading an island for a country, really. It's not as strong as what they actually do already have. Um, then we go up to the 1983 Nationality Act, which kind of put a stop on future people becoming British if they were coming here um, from the Caribbean, if they hadn't naturalized by the 31st of December 1982, that was kind of the cutoff point to become British for people who were effectively the Windrush generation. And there'll be lots of people, my generation and my parents' generation, who will remember everybody mm. sort of scurrying around in 1980s, in particularly 1982 towards the end, saying that Margaret Thatcher says we've got to become British or go home. I mean, she wasn't quite saying go home, but that's the effect of what people thought. So at that time, 
the vast majority of Caribbean people and other Commonwealth people naturalized and became British. The people that we are hearing about now did not naturalize, did not become British, and now they're trying to sort out their documents, which they're required to do um, as is this hostile immigration climate that's being created. They can't find those documents and they can't prove that they've been in the country as long as they have been. Isn't it one of the points which has been mentioned, and David Lammy also flagged that point up to say that how can you be, how can you seek to be naturalized or seek to be British when you're actually British already? That is one of the major things. Well, yeah, I spend a lot of time telling my Caribbean clients that actually you're not British um, because they think, well, they, well, to be fair, I don't know, maybe if we were stronger in the 1980s, maybe we would have insisted that we don't need to naturalise because we're already British. But that didn't happen and the British Nationality Act was passed um, and therefore people did naturalise. And David Lammy, yes, saying that possibly would have been correct had something like that happened at the time, had somebody said that at the time, that we don't need to naturalise as British because we're already British, but that hasn't happened. So in reality, they're not British. And the people like my parents who did naturalise, um, they naturalised and became British. All right, because, because what, what seems to be happening now is that uh, obviously this is, um, it's unfortunate. And uh, basically, you see, I, I think there are two aspects to the whole thing. Two aspects is that one, the, the way the Home Office actually deal with persons um, in the sense of looking at figures, not looking at the personal touch. Um, there's a case with a young lady and she, she broke down crying in the studio at Channel 4 a while ago where she wanted to actually go home to see her mother, uh, sorry, to bury her mother. She wasn't able to do that. She's been in the country for, I uh, think from she was 12 or so, and she's in her 20s now. And uh, her father is very sick as well, who came, who was been here from a long time ago. And she cannot move. Her papers, she spent 2,000 pounds. And right now, I believe she's got uh, uh, papers to deport her. Uh, she needs to leave very soon. So I, I think it's the, the, the raft of how things have been done seem to be one of the compounding factors with the wind rush. Because would you say that of the amount of persons who are descendants of Windrush, what percentage of them are we saying are in this catchment, in this unfortunate situation? 20%, 10%? Um, I, I don't know, I don't have the figures. Um, yeah. I know the vast majority of people did naturalize and have their British passports. Yeah. But, what, but to be fair, it's not so much whether or not people have naturalized, is what they actually have been through. So some people have been detained, some people have been threatened, with the, you know, their livelihoods threatened, they can't work, they couldn't go to the doctor, they couldn't get um, benefits. So even one person is too much. So we've seen lots of people coming out of the woodwork as this whole thing progresses, um, but one person is too much. Because you hit the nail on the head by saying, you know, whether people are British or not British, they didn't, people, they weren't bothered. They lived here for how many years in this country? And the question of Britishness never crossed their minds. That's why they didn't sort out their paperwork. Fair enough. But in reality, the problem is the harsh treatment that these people have been subjected to is what is unacceptable. British or not British is neither here nor there. But you cannot subject people to the kind of treatment that the Home Office subjects people to under the watch of Amber Rudd and under the watch previously of Theresa May and now under the watch of Amber Rudd. This has to stop. And it's not just for Windrush, the Windrush generation. It's for all non-white people, let's just say it as it is, non-white people have to be treated in a much fairer way when they're being dealt with by the Home Office. Mm. And, and so this has to transcend the Windrush generation, to say other people who've also had long residence in the United Kingdom, they will also be dealt with fairly and compassionately as well. That's right. what we want. That's the final outcome. Right. Uh, before we go on to um, some of the, the raft of measures that the, the Home Office has implemented, let's take, us, take ourselves back to six months ago or a year ago or two years ago when you have these cases before you. Um, without setting out um, a particular case, Give us a couple of examples of some cases of this nature which you had to battle through because I believe you have literally gone on the plane and pulled off people already, isn't it? <laughs> I, don't, 
I, ha I haven't physically gone on the plane, but yes, we have had people actually, yes, we, yeah, I suppose we have we've had somebody who's brought back into the country actually. Um, so, but these are different, you see. Um, the people who um, are on, who have removal directions, which is the removal directions is what we call having a ticket, okay? So they've got an actual ticket to get on an actual flight. Those people may be subject to deportation orders, yes. or they may be in the country without leave to remain. So they're what's called illegal migrants, although it's not a phrase I use. They haven't sorted out their paperwork. And if they did sort out their paperwork, they would find that they didn't have permission to be in the country. And therefore, the Home Office starts to remove such people. So those are one type of cases that we challenge as well. But when we're talking of the Windrush generation, I, I, Amber Rudd doesn't seem to have the figures, and neither did Kwasi Kwarteng. But um, I don't suppose that anybody from the Windrush generation has actually been deported from the country. And the reason why I say that is because although the Home Office are harsh and they've mistreated these people and they've not given them their rights that, that they should have in the country, if that case was to go before an immigration judge, so for example, when you are going to physically remove somebody from the country, their family members may contact the solicitor and go to court and the immigration judge is highly unlikely to say that somebody who has clearly got a right to permanently remain in the United Kingdom should be deported the judge will be much more judges are much more um easier to deal with than the home office the home office have been just very harsh this may change moving forward but they've been very harsh typically whereas a judge is more likely to stop the um flight and that's how we stop the flight by getting an injunction from mm -hmm. the judge and also i want to point out to people as well that the whole basis of this is that people who are affected don't have their documents, they don't have their passport. So if they don't have their passport, in order to be removed to another country, they have to have a travel document. And the travel document, they have to get that from the High Commission. There's nobody else that's gonna authorize if somebody's being deported to Jamaica. Yeah. No one's gonna authorize that other than the High Commission. So the Home Office will contact the Jamaican High Commission and they will say, we want to get a travel document for this person. The Jamaican High Commission will then physically interview this person, face-to-face -face interview, yes. to ascertain whether they are Jamaican, which is first and foremost, and they also will ascertain whether this person has um, rights to be in the United Kingdom. Yes. But if people have been, if Windrush generation people have been removed, deported from the United Kingdom, then it would be with the complicity of their High Commission, whether it's the Jamaican, the Grenadian, whichever High Commission, they would have been the ones to issue the travel document. And that's why Amber Rudd said that she has to check with the High Commission. I mean, at the end of the day, she should know and they should know. But yeah. what she's getting at is that, the, and what she didn't say, is that the High Commissions would have authorised the travel document to facilitate the deportation. A question to ask you right there now, in regards to what you, the, the point you mentioned there about the High Commissioner do the travel warrant. Mm. So those persons then, who travel to the Caribbean and then when they're ready to come back to the UK so what papers how did they go to the Caribbean in the first place then yeah this is a typical one and it's it's, it's particularly with older people so what would have yeah. happened another it's a completely separate thing again from people who were being removed so somebody for example um, it's such a simple thing but it happens quite often um, they they had to leave to remain in the country they've lost their passport Yes. They go to their High Commission, and as they are able to, they're not British citizens, they then get a new passport from the High Commission. But the passport inside doesn't have anything, it's empty. So just a Jamaican they, passport, if anything. Because, for example, it's a Jamaican passport. Yes. So the person would then need to contact the Home Office to get whatever document they had in their original passport, or whatever yes. piece of paper they had in the original passport, so that, that doc, the Home Office can then put that document back in the, the new passport. Yes. But people don't realise that's what they've got to do because we have got this mentality, I've been in the UK for how many years, I'm British, and it's just, they don't realise. So they'll leave the country with this empty passport, which yes. you can leave the country, you can go to Jamaica, it's your, it's your country, you've gone with your passport, there's no problem whatsoever. But when they want to then return, they're returning with a blank passport. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're coming to the UK or whether you're going to Abu Dhabi. You can't enter the country 
with a blank passport if you're not from that country. Right. And so that's what happens. Um, it would happen no matter what country you were, you were entering, but that's what happens when people come back and find themselves in that situation. And, and that is one of the... So it, it seems like this whole um, saga is opening a can of worms with other bits regarding Europe as well, because that's another factor with all... Um, well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, because they'll be watching, won't they, to see? Because if, at the end of the day, Commonwealth citizens came into the UK in the same way that European citizens have come into the UK. And so Europe will be watching with bated breath as the, the treatment of the Commonwealth citizens to see how their citizens will be treated um, after Brexit. Because if you like, the, the sort of same thing has happened. Britain has stopped this um, influx of people just coming in from the Caribbean, the same way that Brexit may or may not stop the influx of people coming in from Europe. But we would want to see how the people who are already here, how are they going to be treated? And so, you know, maybe that's behind Amber Rudd's 30 second apology. I mean, she, she was, I couldn't believe how quickly she apologised, to be fair, because if you've been doing something for all these years, how does it take you 30 seconds to apologise? I mean, did you not have a reason for what you were doing? It, it seems very bizarre. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Well, um, let's take a quick break here. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for joining. I've got Rachel O'Keller, um, solicitor who deals a lot with these cases. And uh, please, um, on Instagram, Nan, hi, how are you? Um, and on Facebook, please share this video as well, because um, right now, as I'm talking to you, I'm getting some questions people are putting through privately, and uh, people might want to ask questions. Of course, you can also go to Rachel's office as well, because we're going to put that up there. Um, but I want to say, where are we now? With the Generation N, I just want to read this. The influx ended with the 1971 Immigration Act when Commonwealth citizens already living in the UK were given indefinite leave to remain. After this, a British passport holder uh, born overseas could only settle in the UK if they first had a work permit and second, they could prove that a parent or grandparent had been born in the UK. It's very interesting about this one. I'll come back to you. Where are they now? Many of the arrivals became manual workers cleaners, drivers, and nurses, and some broke new ground in representing black Britons in society. The Jamaican British campaigner, Sam Beaver King, who died in 2016, age 90, arrived at Tilbury Docks in his 20s before finding work as a postman. I must say, Mr. King, I don't know if you know Sam King, um, Rachel, but Sam King, I was supposed to interview him, um, but he passed away just on the eve of that. I, I know his son very well. And uh, he was, I think, one of the first mayor, black mayor in, um, in Southwark as well. Mm. Um, but we're going to try to do something of his life. I want to go back to this bit here about after this, a British passport holder born overseas could only settle in the UK if they firstly had a work permit and secondly could prove that a parent or grandparent had been born in the UK. I think some people are actually grabbing onto that as well because their grandparents were citizens or British subjects in the UK that gave them uh, a clear right to citizenship. Well, has there been any distinction with that? Once... So where is this being read from, sorry? I didn't know where the source is. Yeah, no, it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is in a, a, a package on the BBC website there. Oh, right, okay. Where it yeah. says, um, a British passport holder born overseas could only set in the UK if they first had a work permit and secondly, could prove that a parent or grandparent had been born in the UK. The had been born in the UK bit is a bit which is creating mm. a lot of hassle. Because yeah. people are saying they were a part of the colony, they are part of the British Empire, so therefore, where were they born? Were they born in Jamaica or were they born in the British <laughs> Republic? Well, this you is know? it. But what we do know really is that um, people did come after the 1971 Act and settled in the UK. So yeah. even today, if you've got a parent here, you can come and immediately settle in the United Kingdom and get your indefinite leave to remain. So the, the act didn't stop that from happening. Um, and the parent doesn't have to be born in the UK. They would have to be um, now a British citizen or have indefinite leave to remain um, or be in the army, British army, but they don't have to be um, born in the UK. And even after the 1971 act, um, it wasn't required that the parent was born in the UK, unless, as you say, we consider that before independence, they were born in the UK. But I think, you know, realistically, born in the UK means the island of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, that's born in the UK. 
anything else and you're not born in the UK. So people can come here um, and claim British citizenship through ancestry if they have a grandparent who is born in the United Kingdom. But that means not born in the colony, born in the actual United Kingdom. Right. And it, it, seem, it seems, would you, would you say, uh, you mentioned, would you, do, you, do you sense that there is a, by the raft of measures, which we will talk about later, which Amber Rudd has set out, is it opening a door, is it a precedent for compensation for those who have been wrong, but also compensation for those who have already paid? Well, th those who've already paid for British citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. You know, people may want a refund from the 1980s when they paid that money. But she's already opened the door for compensation because she's clearly said that the Home Office will be giving compensation to those people. I imagine the Home Office being a government body that will come in from an array of different departments. So, for example, people may well um, have their benefits backdated um, or they may well have their housing benefit or disability or whatever they were trying to claim backdated. But there's going to be other compensation that we haven't necessarily considered, which could be the pain and suffering. If somebody couldn't go to their, their mother's funeral, then, you know, that's pain and suffering and that may have to be included in the mix as well. So with, in terms of compensation, people will need to take advice separately from just telling, letting the Home Office tell them what compensation they're going to be entitled to and take proper legal advice to ensure that the compensation that they get is, is what they um, have really gone through, is, so fits what they've gone through, basically. Right. I want to, I want to go back to this bit about the amnesty, because uh, Patrick Vernon, you know, a good guy, Patrick Vernon, uh, formed this amnesty oh, yes. yeah. edition. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it may be about 200,000 now, because the last time I looked at it before, it was 157,000. David Lammer says, I'm campaigning for an amnesty, but in reality, it would not be an amnesty because that word implies wrongdoing. Mm. These people have done nothing wrong. Government must simply do the right thing, establish a human route to clarify their status in this country and change the burden of proof. Now, that petition, you saw that petition, Yes, I have, yeah. Mm. yeah. What do you think about that petition, the word well, amnesty? Yeah, well, they, yeah, an amnesty is not appropriate because they, they don't need an amnesty because they're not illegally in the country, they're legally here. Whether the government now needs to have a different class of British citizenship to give to these people or find a route that they can... I mean, they've been living here for all these years anyway, so I don't see why they can't just naturalise um, and she's offered a fee exemption. But they don't need an amnesty because um, they haven't overstayed. They're legally in the country. Right, right. And, and okay, what would you say then? Um, I, I know there's a burden of proof where four pieces of items for every year. Was that true? Four pieces of items for every year they've been in the country? Well, from my experience, I don't really um, go on what the Home Office requests. And I think some of this may be that um, people were... People have different types of advice. People advise differently. I mean, some people hadn't even put in an application. And, um, you know, I heard the, the gentleman, he's a fellow Grenadian, he died whilst waiting to sort out his papers. But if what I've heard in the papers is true, he actually hadn't put an application into the Home Office. So I think a lot of the time, people can be scared from putting in an application. Um, I don't bother with... Um, having because it's not actually even four pieces it's actually six pieces of what the home office form says six pieces of information for each year that you've been here my thing is to prove that somebody's been in the united kingdom so we would take the application to the home office if the home office refused that then we go to court and yeah. the judge is much more sympathetic because sometimes you have to just make the application get past the home office and go to court and challenge the home office the home office are not the be all and end all yes they are the government but the government is checked by the courts. So just because a Home Office say no or you think they're going to say no, that's not how this system works. The British system works that if you can't get redress from a government department, you can carry on and take them to court. So in circumstances like this, we don't bother myself as a, a solicitor. I'm not going to wait for someone to get six pieces of information because they haven't got it. My thing is to prove that they've been in the country for the length of time they've been here. And that can be easy bringing witnesses to court. You know, you can bring people to court to say, I have seen this person. But all these costs have to be borne by 
the applicant, i.e. the immigrant, isn't it? Illegal or not. There's no legal aid for these areas, isn't it? There isn't. And people say that if you, you know, I, I sometimes say to clients, look, if I wanted to emigrate to Australia, I would have to put maybe £10,000 aside to facilitate me emigrating to Australia. Some people think that there should be legal aid for people to, to um, pay for their applications here. Some people think that they shouldn't be legal aid. My personal view is if you want to emigrate into a country, you should have sufficient funds to do so. I think it's a natural, a natural thing. But in terms of the costs, then yes, the costs, effectively, they didn't pay in 1980, which when it was, I think, three or 60 pounds, has now risen to 1,200 pounds and even 1,300 pounds. So the immigration costs keep going up and up. And many, many people pay those costs all the time. But yes, they would have to pay the, the home office costs because the 1,200 is the home office fee. And if yes. they want to drop the solicitor, then the solicitor's fee as well. You know, I, I, I can relate personally because, you know, Rachel, I'm not born in this country. I'm an immigrant. <laughs> I came mm -hmm. all the way from Jamaica. I came here in 1992. I came to study law. And I remember the times when I had to go down to the home office. Uh, I, I tend to always go there very early in the morning, like five o'clock, six. I'll never forget this taxi guy has done it for years. He always takes me there early. And you always have a person at the front of the queue who actually are selling the space at the front of the queue and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why I didn't like to actually um, send my papers in, me personally, was that I believe that there was a perception that they would stigmatize you as a Jamaican. That was some of the things that people used to say. And I always believe that I'd rather to eyeball them and go away with my passport and my right. visa. Yes. Yeah. So that's how I always do it, personally speaking. Go down there, eyeball them, and I remember one year I went there, I challenged one of the officers because they were being a bit condescending. And I said, listen, I'm not begging anything. I need a supervisor. Of course, that's really brave. And I mean, at the home office, you know. Um, but but I, I can understand why some persons are really scared. Because as someone just said a while ago, he said, warn those who are illegal and may try to jump on the band, Windrush bandwagon, they could be possibly be deported. Because, <laughs> because the, there is the, the law still exists, isn't it? It hasn't changed, has it, Rachel? The law hasn't changed. No, <laughs> nothing changed, and, and and that's a good thing for us to point out to people. Because yes. I had um, a client come into the office with a document um, which is not relevant. Solicitors are saying um, if your case, if you came to the UK after 1973. The Home Secretary has said that she will consider all such applications of overstayers who arrived here after the 1st of January 1973. Well, that's always been the case. I mean, they've always, the Home Office will consider any application that you put before them. It doesn't have to be before or after 1973. Nothing has changed. It's a bit like with Brexit, people, you know, running around and we're kind of saying, look, nothing has changed. But in this situation, nothing has changed and nothing is likely to change. Because what changed already changed in 1971 and 1981 in the Immigration Act and the Nationality right. Act. Um, so nothing else is going to change. All Amber Rudd has to ensure is that these people are dealt with compassionately, that their cases are done expeditiously and quickly through the system, and that whatever rights they're going to have, whatever level of Britishness they already possess, they should have the documentary evidence to show that, or if they choose to fully naturalise, then they should be allowed to naturalise, and she's offered them a fee waiver. Mm, mm, that, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Could you set out, based on your experience and the cases that you're dealing with, um, we, we mentioned about that they, when they go to the, um, they won't be deported, but even though they won't be deported by the going to court, and the tender court will always tend to be um, sympathetic to their cause, but they still go through these cases of being in detention. They do go through the trauma of not wanting to knock, open their doors. Mm. What are some of the detrimental or mind boggling or what should I say, undignified living psychological conditions some of these persons went through or even persons waiting for their papers? Well, what we need to, um, if we're talking about detention, what yeah. we need Clear of about detention is detention is actually prison. So the Home Office will call it an immigration removal centre. We practitioners call it an immigration detention centre. Effectively, it's a prison. Why? Because right. you can't leave 
and you're in, in an enclosed environment with many different people who you don't know. But one step up from that, a detention centre is actually worse than a prison. Because if you're going to prison, you go, you'd have committed a crime, um, been found guilty. The judge will then issue you with a sentence and say, right, you are going to prison for, I don't know, a year. Okay, yeah. so you know you're going to maybe come out, get out with good time after four or five months. Okay, if you go to a detention center, so you're a person who hasn't regularized their status, yes. um, you go to report, as many people have to do these days, and they you, you, you're not aware you left your house, sometimes you've left your children in school, you may have left your friend in the car and said, I'll be back in a minute. You yeah. go inside the, the um, reporting center. And you're detained. You're told that you're not going back home. You're put into a van and taken somewhere in a detention centre. For many women, they're taken into Yarlswood, which is Oxfordshire, been there, Oxfordshire, I think, area. But it's in the middle of nowhere, basically. So you're taken to a detention centre and you're detained and you cannot leave. And you're not told how long you're going to be in that detention centre. So the mental torture... Um, it would be incredible. And I think it's worse than actually going to prison because in prison you may have done something wrong if you were guilty. You may be aware, you would have been advised that you will be imprisoned and you'll be told how long that will be. For immigration, um, although they send you a letter saying you're liable to be detained and forcibly removed, it doesn't give people the proper notice that they would need and it's effectively a prison. So that's what people are going through at the moment. I don't think we realise in this country just how many people are being imprisoned for immigration purposes. So in a, so in a way, you know where you stand. That's what that's the point you're, you're setting up there, uh, Rachel. When you're, you're, when, you're, when you're in prison, you know where you yeah, stand. Yeah, you know where you stand. You, you know, you count the days downwards. Um, and uh, somebody was saying from Detention Action when we had a talk together, um, people who are detained they count the days upwards because it's how many days have you been detained you have no clue when you're going to be released right. and it's administrative it's somebody in an office who decides it's not even a judge it's just in an office mm, mm, mm. it's a okay. <laughs> now uh, okay would you say this whole thing has been politicized well it is, politi it is politics now, yeah, but, but is it, has it been politicized whereby Labour is taking pop shots, Conservatives, and um, there's now this tug of war as to the blame culture. Amber Rudd, should she resign? The Prime Minister, she, she was the Home Secretary, um, who presided over a lot of these um, raft of measures, even though they said 2009 was when the blending cards were destroyed, but now they're saying it wasn't destroyed, they had found them. Which one is it? Well, the landing cards are neither here nor there in terms of proving whether somebody has been in the United Kingdom for any length of time. It's a, it's a good document to have to show when somebody arrived, but it would be better if they kept their passport or had access to their passport if they came on a family member's passport. But yeah. realistically speaking, all British governments have tried to clamp down on immigration. But until the 2014 Immigration Act, which was done under the Conservative and Liberal Democrat coalition, um, nobody really um, cared about people's status in the way that it seems to um, overshadow every other thing. And that's why people are struggling now, even though they've been legally here, because for all those years, and we also have to remember, even people who are actually illegally in the country, they've also worked too. So before we had Europe, there were very many people coming from the Caribbean as visitors who were enabled to stay in the United Kingdom and yes. work, although they didn't have papers. And through successive years, governments have clamped down on this. And the 2014 Act was kind of the um, high point where uh, Theresa May got carried away with herself, frankly, um, it's not British the way they, they will be. That Immigration Act 2014 is not British. It's not what we would expect from Britain to right. penalise and deliberately aim and attack people who are vulnerable and who have been in the country most times for many, many years. And not just the Windrush generation, but people who've been here 15, 16, 17 years yeah. were suddenly um, unable to work. OK, they were working illegally, but at the end of the day, they were, it was only half illegally because most people knew they were working anyway, you know? Yeah. So these people have been clamped down on and they're also struggling in the same way we've heard the stories of the Windrush generation struggling. So it, it's a climate that was created by Theresa May 
I think the, the buck stops with her, actually. <laughs> Amber and, Word may be continuing it, but it yeah. started with and And therefore, as a result of that, um, the, the bus as well, or the van which was going around saying go home as well, that didn't I mean, help. <laughs> It was no, it was all appalling, you know. It was, um, they the conservative government, right, have to take a deep look within themselves as to how this has happened. Um, and it has to change, it has to change for people from the Windrush generation, and it has to change for people who came to settle. Because Albert Thompson, who was the gentleman with the prostate cancer, yeah. he, um, he actually is not from the Windrush generation. He came here as a settled child and he's yes. struggling. And then there's also people who've been here for more than 20 years, which is the second um, sort of threshold that you have to reach. Mm. All these people are in this country um, with good grounds to be here, but they're struggling because of the harsh immigration climate that was created in 2014 and even in the years previously. And another thing that has to happen is this harsh climate has meant that although they're saying people need to regularize their status, what we're seeing is that it's becoming impossible for people to regularize their status. These people who've been here for 15, 16 years, they're not going to go home. There's nowhere for them to go back to in many cases. They yeah. left their country over a decade ago. Um, the government also has to take a more compassionate approach to how they deal with these people, because we, we, we've all read letters saying, uh, you know, you should, you can communicate with your family by social media. You don't have to be in the same country as your family. All this kind of thing has to stop before that's and, to end. The government needs to be more compassionate. And and when you go to Jamaica, you learn to speak Jamaica, isn't it? You what? Sorry, because you know I'm from Grenada, of course. No, no, I know, <laughs> but I know, but one of the flyers which was going around, which Andrew Holness, the former, the fact, the prime minister of Jamaica was saying that there was some flyer which was when you are deported. Um, yeah. Speak Jamaican or speak something or some dialect. That was something. Oh yes, yes, I saw yeah. that. I've never seen that before in a letter. I must say, um, yeah. I found that to be a template that they use, and I find that very bizarre. But I can believe it. Yeah, you know, they would say they they say the most ridiculous things. Yes, yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have um, with me on the on the line. Um, Miss, uh, those on face, um, Instagram, sorry, you might not be able to see this unless you go onto Facebook, but I've got Rachel O'Keller, who is from Ruggles Solicitors, and um, on the front of her page, she said, if you receive a deportation order from the Home Office, it can be an extremely worrying time. A deportation order is served on a foreign national, not British. I like that. That is powerful. A deportation order is served on a foreign national that is not British. So therefore, and this is the crux of the whole thing now, Rachel, isn't it? This is where oh, yeah. a, lot, a, lot of law, a lot of lawyers now are now rubbing their hands now, you know, yeah. because, because you cannot be deported if you are a British subject. And therefore, the big question which is out there is, and, and this is what someone said to me, well, my parents didn't do it because they never thought they needed to do it because they were British. Their, their passports were British. So therefore, there was no need to do anything, even though that, that call was made to go and regularize yourself and get your status and be British. They were saying, that doesn't make sense. I'm British. Yes. British. <laughs> yes. You can't be, um, you can be deported if you, if you haven't made, become British. If you didn't naturalize, and be, if you don't have a British passport and you can't apply for one, then you're not British. That's what, you know, because many people think they're British and that's what I yeah, say. But, yeah, but, th but these persons came and they had a British passport. Yes, they came and a British passport. You mean before 1973? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. yes. One thing I'd like to add as well, if you actually came before 1973, because, um, and that's why I say about uh, indefinitely to remain and the coming before 1973 is a stronger one to have. Because if you have indefinitely to remain, that can be revoked and you can be deported, okay? Yeah. If you came before 1973 and you've lived in the UK continuously before um, 1973 for at least five years, it doesn't matter if and you're from the Commonwealth, you don't have to be British, you can't be deported. Wow. So that's something that people need to bear in mind. As far as um, the passports that people came on when they were, um, which were British passports, the only real way to explain that is that those passports were colonial Britain. 
Britain is no longer a colony, so we don't have those UK and colony passports anymore. Mean, we only have Britain. Britain. Have any more colonies, you mean? Is that Britain is no longer a colony? You mean um, Britain? Britain hasn't any more colonies? Yeah, there's, yes, there's yes. no longer. Um, yes, there's no longer any colonies. Yes. Yes. Uh, to my knowledge, am I, are there any... they, have, they have dependency, like came Yeah, and dependence. Yes. Islands but those like passports were for UK and colonies. Yes. That's what the passport was. So they were colonial passports. Mm. Um, and the only way to explain that is to say that those passports are no longer issued. Mm. So the people who came with those passports may be trying to renew those passports when they don't exist anymore. The passports that exist until we get to Brexit are the European and British ones now. Yes, yes. Well, one of the things that, I, 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 as we discussed before, is that we're not going to go down into all the blame factor and all those sort of things and get... But it's, 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 it's a way forward, isn't it? It's a way mm. forward to alleviate some of the, the fearsome persons, uh, the way forward as to what the Home Secretary is saying she's going to do, what the government is saying is going to do. The government has accepted that they're failing, they've failed. The government is saying that they're going to do some things, amend the wrong. Do you think the government can survive this? Do you think the next election... May election is going to be the third next week, which I'm a candidate. <laughs> it's going to hit people very big time, isn't it? Especially those of a conservative leaning. You mean the May, this May, the third local May, election? It, May the third, yes. Even though it's yeah, more I... about bins and all those sort of things. <laughs> you what, sorry? What did you say? Even though the election is more about local council issues and <laughs> the rubbish bins and how many bins and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think certainly um, I've been contacted by councillors who say, particularly if they live in eth high um, ethnic minority areas, um, where there's a high ethnic minority population, um, that obviously is what people are concerned about. And it's, it's not just the fact that what the election is about, but sometimes people want to send a message, yes. um, you know, yes. to a government, and they forget about the bins and the potholes, and they send a clear message. Um, We'll see because some people in our world it's all about Windrush, but for some people they don't even they don't even know what that. I, I mean, I said to somebody, you know, um, I want to come and talk to your people about the Windrush, and they said, oh, we're going to celebrate that in the in June, and I said, no, that's not what I mean. I mean the the saga that's happening, and they were totally unaware. So right. for some people it's all consuming, and for other people they're not aware. But I think even though they are local elections, if people have a message to send to the government then we know that they'll use any election to send that message. We'll wait right. and see. Okay. Well, let's look at, let's, let's look at um, some of the, the, the raft of proposal, the measures uh, she has taken to guarantee Windrush migrants cost-free British citizenship. In other words, I want to enable the Windrush generation to acquire the status that they deserve, British citizenship, quickly, at no cost, and with proactive assistance through the process. First, I'll waive the citizenship fee for anyone in the Windrush generation who wish to apply for citizenship. This applies to those who have no current documentation and also to those who have it. So I come to you in this position now and uh, do you, have you got your brief? It, it, what happens now with that first stage, Rachel? If you come and you don't have documentation. Yeah, as, as what it says now, I, I will make it go free, you know. How, they, they're not going to want all of these raft of documents, these four pieces of documents every year, right? We want, to happen, want it to happen free, quickly, at no cost, with proactive assistance through the process. Yeah, I mean, it, we're going to have to see how that works. I don't think that's actually realistic. It's not realistic. It may be realistic to give a fee exemption to people applying for it, but it is not realistic to allow people to turn up without documents. I mean, I'm the kind of person I think people can live wherever they want to live. But, you know, on a realistic level, how will you tell the rest of the country that we have given British citizenship to people who have turned up without documents? People must have documents to substantiate their claim to British citizenship. However, the problem has been that the Home Office has requested too many documents. And they say ridiculous things like, oh, we're not sure if you were in the country between 1998 and 2001. Which has, you know, so they've tried to um, say that you may have left for three years and you've broken your continuous residence. So this is the kind of thing that we want. We don't want 
the, the, the immigration law to be completely um, a free for all, you know, to use a term. We want a proper immigration law that people can understand and that the country can have confidence in because the rest of the country is not going to want to know that people, anybody, is just turning up without documents and being given British citizenship. They just need to make it a normal test that people can pass. If they're eligible, that's all they need to do. So what you're trying to say is, instead of being um, not practical, is to make things... Yeah. It's to make things a bit more fair, if anything. Just make it fair. She's swinging from one side to another. She just needs to come in the middle. Just make it a fair process mm. that the country can accept and that the, the people who need that, who are going through the application process, can meet the threshold if they're eligible. Right. One, one, of, one of the things that um, many people, I don't think they're fair. They just think that it's like a, a, a money-making thing is the knowledge of language and life in the UK test. She said, I waived the requirement to carry out a knowledge of language and life in the UK test. Is that something which is challenging for people? I mean, I didn't do it at the time when I got my citizenship, you know what I mean? Yes, it was introduced, um, wasn't it by David Blunkett, I think? I remember yeah. the life in the UK yeah. test. Um, yeah. But it's a ridiculous test. I mean, you know, it's kind of like a joke among in the immigration world that the majority of British people, I think a judge even commented in the, in the House of Lords, I think, who commented that she couldn't pass the test. It's just a ridiculous test. It doesn't have anything to do with Britain, and that test should be abolished for everybody anyway. And even the English language test should be abolished, because at the end of the day, if somebody's living in the United Kingdom, many people live here, um, particularly older Asian people, they're also Commonwealth. So if you now say, oh, you can get your British citizenship if they came between nine, because, you know, there's not just Caribbean people, and um, the whole floodgate that's going to open. So people that came between 1948 and 1973, in, and they're from an Asian community and they can't speak English, you can't tell them to take a test 60 years later. It's just not appropriate. So, and, and these tests, I think they're ridiculous anyway. I think they should just be dismantled. Whilst we're dismantling this system for the Windrush generation, I think it's an opportunity to overhaul the whole immigration process. And these two tests can go with it as well. And, and, and that cost, they cost, don't they? They cost. To do um, the life in the UK test costs £50. 50 pounds. Um, and the, um, the English test will cost whatever the test centre charges. I tell you, I tell you, I, I tell you one, one of the things that I, I put out there recently is about even the visa restrictions from the Caribbean to the UK, i.e. Jamaica. I say that is something that they need to, and Johannes and the, the Commonwealth guys need to actually deal with as well, because I, I think it's, a bit unfair now. It, I remember when it came out, when the other little jugs was coming into the UK with cocaine and all those sort of things. Air Jamaica, they used to call it cocaine air. I never forget that. Uh, but now things have changed. Don't you think that should be lifted, the visa restrictions? Uh, well, I definitely. I mean, the Queen is, the, 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 Jamaica's a Commonwealth realm country. Um, the Queen is the head of state. It's the only Commonwealth realm country where people need a visa to come to the United Kingdom. It shouldn't have been put in place in the first place. Um, yeah. And it should be lifted. All that, and that's why I say it's very important now to not just focus just on this Windrush generation yeah. issue. Look at the world. The, the, the whole thing needs the to be so overhauled. Yeah, the whole thing needs to be overhauled. Yeah. Yeah, I, I put a video out there recently talking about the, um, the visa bit and also put a video out there talking about the, the high cost of plane fares to the Caribbean. 700 pounds, you can go under... Uh, New Zealand and spend 20 hours flight to Australia, Jamaica, nine hours, 1200, 1500, even kids, children, five, six years of age, a thousand pounds. It's yeah. crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's a, so thirdly, um, the children of the Windrush generation who are in the UK will in most cases are British citizens. However, where that is not the case, they need to apply for naturalization. I shall waive the fee. Let's deal with the fee. Are these fees high? I can't remember. The time when I did it, the fees were in the hundreds. Uh, what, what are the fees like now, Rachel? Well, when I first started practicing in 98, the fee was around £70. Pounds. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know how much it was in 1978, 1972. So it's a bit too young for that. But, yes. um, but now it's 1000 It just went up last week couple of weeks ago it was 1200 and i think it's gone up by about 50 pounds or so i think it's in the it's about 1300 pounds now which is very high 
I mean, it's not a complicated form to, you know, I mean, yes, the Home Office says the outcome, so you become British. But I think the fee is a bit too high for what it is, because you come to the end of the road, you're eligible for British citizenship. It's just kicking the ball through the net. So the, the fee is, can, that fee can come down for everybody, really. Um, yeah. It could be around about an admin fee, you know, I don't know, £150 or so, you know, admin fee. So, so therefore, what we're talking about as well is to, I don't know if, if who's doing it, but maybe people looking at ways, okay, let's deal with the fees. Let's make this fair. £1,000. Mm. And guess what? If that person put that application in and they put that thousand pounds and they forget to put a piece of information in and it's rejected. Do they have to do another thousand pounds for another ap subsequent application? If your application is considered to be invalid, then the Home Office will send your application back and they recently have decided they will deduct 25 pound admin fee and then oh. they will return your fee. So the balance of your fee, they'll return that to you. Yeah, someone say, and you also have to pay that surcharge. That's what someone just said a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that, well, the surcharge is the Home Office fee. It's part of the fee, really, because you can't, they won't process your application without the surcharge. So the fee, they will give you, so let's just deal with the issue of the fee itself. So say for a typical application for leave to remain, the fee at the moment is £1,003. Yes. Um, that's the actual Home Office fee. So if your application is found to be invalid, then they will return that to you, less £25. Right, right. If for, yeah, sorry, I'm listening. If, um, if you pay the surcharge, so the surcharge is at typically another £500 on top. So it's going to be £1,003 plus £500. Um, and if your application is refused, they will return the £500 to you. And that's automatic. So they'll send back the £500. If your application is refused because you didn't put a bit of information in there and the caseworker's having a bad day and decides it's not invalid, we're going to refuse you, then no, they won't give you back any of your fee. So a refused application, you don't get anything back. Someone just said, someone just yeah. said, are the fees another aspect of the hostile environment and the deterrent? Is a deterrent for what? Is a deterrent from applying or to go to the home office to regularize yourself? Is, is the fee. I think in a way the fees are, um, they are a deterrent for some people, but I think what the Home Office have seen, um, and this is why they keep raising the fees, is they've seen that people will pay the fee. You know, it's, it's gone up from, well, when I first started practicing in the 90s, the Home Office used to pride themselves, because we as solicitors, we used to charge, but the Home Office used to pride themselves in the corner of the form, they'd say, this form has been provided free of charge. So that the client knows the home office form was free and if you're paying any money it's because the solicitor's charging you then they realized um when tony i believe it was under tony blair that they could actually um start charging yeah. so they started charging and then successive governments have just continued to raise the fee and at the moment there's a provision that the fee can be raised up until 2020 and that's what the government has said that they're going to do they're going to right. continue raising. Right. And fourthly, says, I'll ensure that those who, are made, who made their lives here but have now retired to their country of origin uh, are able to come back to the UK. Again, I'll waive the cost of any fees associated with this process and will work with our embassies and high commissions to make sure people can easily access this offer. What does that mean? I'll ensure that who made their <laughs> lives here. What does that mean? I mean, I mean fees. Isn't plain fears a part of fees as well? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, what does it all mean? You know, what, what does she mean? Because I, I don't it, know what that means, actually. If, I mean, because if, you've, if you have indefinite leave to remain um, and you leave the country for more than two years, you cannot automatically come back. You have to apply as a returning resident to come back into the country. So whether she's now saying that she's going to waive that, so i.e. you can go to the Caribbean, for as long as you like, and then, you know, once you had indefinite leave to remain, you can just use that and come back, then that's fine, you know, because they don't have to pay for that. That's already in their passport. Yeah, yeah. What typically happens is when at the airport they realise you've gone for more than two years, they will cancel it right there in the airport. So she can just tell the staff in the airport, don't cancel it, just let them come back with their indefinite leave to remain, and that would solve that problem. Someone, someone said on Instagram, did you know French Caribbean people in Martinique and Guadeloupe have EU citizenship. K 
can settle work and proper and prop, work properly in the UK and EU. No visa required. Well, so, yes. When I used to live in France, they used to say "on est français," which means we're French. They're yeah. actually French, so yeah. they they're part of Europe, effectively. Right, right. As as he said, they can they can own their their property as well. So yes, because they're French. They're French. They're French citizens. Yes. So so in effect, what it's saying. And this is a bit that David Lammy has a problem with. In effect, this means anyone from the Windrush generation who now wants to become a British citizen will be able to do so. Where, where, where is it that David Lammy have a problem with this? Can you specify that era? In this effect, anyone from the Windrush generation who now wants to become a British citizen will be able to do so. Well, David Lammy is saying that they're already British. Yes. Um, a newspaper article saying, well, how can you give somebody something that they've already got? Yes. But if we go right back to where we started from pre, pre um, the 31st of December 1982, people were told from the Windrush, because don't forget, the Windrush generation, my parents are part of the Windrush generation because they yeah. were here during the time, they naturalised. So the 31st of December 1982, the majority of people did naturalise and become British, which yeah. is exactly what the people who are struggling now could have done at that time so from a Caribbean point of view what you know in terms of not even the legal side but just a community side people are saying well hang on a minute we had to naturalize in 1982 so of course these same people they have to naturalize as well otherwise why did any of us pay our fee in 1982 why did any of us naturalize if um, we were all already British. It, it was, it, it's a farce. That's basically what it, what it would look like. So unless they're saying that all the people from the Commonwealth, not just the Caribbean, on the 31st of December 1982 shouldn't have bothered naturalising because they were already British, the only other thing they can say is we'll give you um, a fee waiver so that you can just naturalise as British. She's going to have to ignore David Lammy, otherwise it's just going to rock the system to its core. Right, right. So in a, in a sense, you've got to have a level head while, while this whole maze is going through uh, as much as possible. Now, the other bit also, um, Rachel, are you okay to ask, answer questions as they come, if anything, yeah? Yeah, that's no problem at all. You've got yeah. to go to your bed, I don't know, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fine. This, yeah, she said that the Home Office would pay compensation to those people who have suffered loss. Now, that's a biggie there, isn't it? And I read it further. The state has let these people down, travel documents denied, exclusions from returning to the UK, benefits cut, even threats of removal. This to a group of people who came to help build this country, people who should be thanked. Sometimes I think some 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 um, speeches are right are being written for. Oh, you're person. reading my mind. I was going to say, did she say this? That's what I was going to say. Is it's it there. This is a part of the speech. I've got the speech here. Just crazy. Um, this has happened for some time. I will put this right. And where people have suffered loss, they will be compensated. Did she not realize all these years that people were going through all this? This yeah. is a poor the, the Home Office will be setting up a new scheme to deliver this, which will be run by an independent person. I will set out further details around its scope and how people will be able to access it in the coming weeks. Now, you have dealt with many persons. You have seen cases where persons are not able to work. We have listened to cases yeah. where they have not been able to work. One guy was on the television saying he's in 30,000 debt. He's not able to work. He worries about going outside. He's got a problem with his leg. He mm -hmm. can't go to the hospital because now he's been asked to provide documents of his citizenship because he, he's not a British subject. How will those compensation work, Rachel? Well, you know, as we were saying, it would be basically, um, it's going to work as how all compensation works. You're going to have to do the maths, going to have to um, see, uh, you know, if you trip or fall, then there's a format and a matrix as to how your compensation will be calculated. And I imagine that the Home Office are going to speak to their legal advisors to put that format together yes. for compensation around this issue also. But at the end of the day, people should seek legal advice to make sure that they're not being um, shortchanged, basically, and that the compensation they have covers everything. So it covers the actual money that they've paid, but also anything else, pain and suffering or any emotional distress, it covers that also. Um, 
it could even cover, you know, some kind of therapeutic, um, because if I suddenly lost my job and somebody said to me, well, actually you're illegally in the country, what would you do? It, you know, it, it's impossible to survive. So there, there's a lot of emotional impact that this would have had and the compensation will have to cover that as well. But I'll tell you something, I was speaking to, um, to some, a client today and sort of saying, you know, I'm also asking you so that I can see whether you're gonna get any compensation the person said to me, actually, I don't want, I'm not really into compensation. Because you know us in the Caribbean, we're so like, laissez-faire, you know. Uh, I, it's not the compensation, I just want my life back. I just oh, want my right. life, basically. You know, I want to live my life in peace. That's what a lot of people want. Yes. And then, and then she said, my officials will take a generous approach to help people get the documentation they need. Um, my, my officials are helping those concerned to provide, to prove their residence. And they are taking a proactive and generous approach so they can easily establish their rights. We do not need to see a definitive documentary proof of date of entry or of continuous residence. This is why the debate about registration slips and landing card is misleading. Instead, the case will have made a judgment based on all the circumstances of the case and on the balance of probabilities. That is very subjective, isn't it, at the same time? It's very subjective, and if Amber Rudd continues to speak, I think she's going to have to consider her position, because realistically, all these things should be the basis of a proper functioning immigration service anyway. You know, clients sign the form, and we say to them, look, you've got to be truthful on your form, you've got to give all the information, because in any event, they will cross-check with all different departments. And the Home Office are the first people, if somebody... Um, forgets that they had, uh, so for example, a very minor criminal conviction years ago, the Home Office are the first people to say, well, you didn't tell us about this because they cross-check across departments. So they could have, they've had the opportunity to cross-check across departments for a long time. Um, and, and we would need an explanation. If this kind of um, report keeps coming out from Amber Rudd, she's going to have to give an explanation as to why this hasn't been happening all along. Yeah. You know, why? Why, this is supposed to be a normal immigration process that they cross-check with different departments. So why was that not happening? That, that's interesting. Someone just said here, and I'll just pick up on it. Someone on Instagram said, they need to refund my money back. I came to England on a British passport. Why do I have to pay for a British citizenship? <laughs> well, exactly. That's what a lot of people are now wondering. Um, you know, somebody, a pastor of a church said there are people in the church are saying, since we were all British when we got here, because there's a lot of elderly people, isn't it? And, you know, since we were all British, what did we pay for? We maybe want, we need a refund. It's a can of worms. <laughs> now, it, it, it really is. It really is. And, um, hmm. and, and I believe that um, just, like, just like in Grenfell, where a few persons were caught out fraudulently trying to scam by saying their husband and children died um, yeah. and were caught out. Unfortunately, I believe you're going to have some of these cases where persons are going to somewhat trying to defraud the system as well. Yeah, I, I, have, I, ha I have been having a few calls of people. I don't know whether they're trying to defraud the system necessarily, but I mm. think they're trying to have some hope that, um, that their case, although they've been here maybe since the year 2000s, um, that their case, that the impact somehow... The, sorry, the Windrush somehow impacts their case. So I don't know if it's fraudulent. I'm sure there probably will be some people. Yes. But, um, you know, I think people want to know how is this going to impact their case? Um, well, yeah, and the well, way it yeah. could, how it could impact them. Well, in a way, it is maybe reparation, rep, repatri, reparation in a way, as some people are saying, this is a, a way of really bleeding the British, um, the money which has been paid, um, out. Uh, as a matter of fact, people are still paying for, I understand, uh, British black people have been paying for some of the money which has been paid to pay off the plantation workers many years ago still, just recently been paid off. And uh, and if black people has built the UK, as an Irish said as well, we and the black people has built the UK. And the Asians, and Asians as well. They will be coming. And Asians yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so therefore, there's some mm -hmm. hardcore reality which is hitting home. Yeah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, in our last minute with uh, Rachel O'Keller, um, solicitor, we are looking at some of the rafts of measures which has been implemented by Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, at this time. And, uh, and so thank you for coming.
and you can watch it on the replay, those who are going to get the last tail end of it. The burden of proof on some of the Windrush generations and evidence in the legal was too much on the individual. And now we are working with this group in a much more proactive and personable way in order to help them. Because before Rachel, it was he who asserts must prove. Everything. I, I always find this about the Home Office all the while. Is it? They know everything. I always have this perception. They know everything. But you've got to prove and tell them what they know. <laughs> well, I mean, I think in a way, a normal immigration system should require somebody to prove that they, when they came here, and that should be by your passport or you know, you can always get your um, file from the Home Office, which will say the date that their records say that you arrived. So the Home Office will normally have a record of when you arrived, maybe not going all the way back to the 1970s. But they, the problem is that they were too harsh on the, the people who were trying to prove um, the time they've been here. And as I say, it's not just the Windrush generation, it's all people from successive years. They've been very harsh in the way they've been dealing with these people. And so a simple thing is to treat these people with more compassion. And if they provide a birth certificate of a child who was clearly born in 1973, then you would assume that the mother was in the country and you can equally assume if she was married to the father that he was in the country and just take a more pragmatic and realistic approach than what the Home Office do. They write some of the most ridiculous letters, you know, quite infuriating letters. So all that sort of thing has to stop for all people who are trying to get their applications through the Home Office. Yeah, because I, I've been seeing some letters and, and um, I think Lamit put up a letter today as well uh, sometimes you wonder who are the authors of some of these letters which are yeah. going out to people. Yes. And and, and the way it is worded, um, people sometimes maybe don't even want to look at the letter. Um, I can imagine my that. clients, my clients, the letters can be sometimes 12 pages. So I phone a client and say, did you see a letter? I didn't look at the letter. You know, good or bad, they just don't want to look at the letter because they're so stressed out. And sometimes, no, your application's fine, it's gone through. But they can be so stressed out that they actually can't look at these letters. And the way sometimes the Home Office um, write, it's just a template. They, they sometimes even get the country wrong, the gender wrong. It is just a template. So all that has to change. Yeah. There's a big question which was asked about, and I think maybe you have said it, and I, I don't know who have said it as well, that, uh, she said that a review of more than 4,000 cases had not found any evidence of anyone being wrongly deported and that another 4,000 odd cases are still being checked. Do you think, I mean, a lot of deportations have been happening. I, I know, the secret planes and all those sort of things. Has anyone been deported from the Windrush? I doubt it, to be fair. Because as I, I was saying, well, yeah, I, I sincerely doubt that because... You know, if people have been strict about what the Windrush period is, 1948 to 73, 1st of January 1973, as I say, because these people, they don't have their passports, that's the whole issue. Yes, and yes. But the high commissions would be the ones to issue the travel document. And I would find it very strange for a high commission to issue a travel document for somebody that they speak to who says they came here in prior to 19, the 1st of January 1973, and then for that High Commission to actually issue a travel document to facilitate the person's deportation, I would find that very strange. And the High Commission would have a lot to answer for if that's what's happened. Right. So, 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 so what you're saying, Rachel, is that you doubt that anyone has actually been deported off the Windrush um, generation. Uh, you're talking children as well as also persons who literally came. Well, the Windrush generation, I'm talking about people who were here between 1948 to 1973. Now, in terms of the children, mm. a lot of the time, sometimes children who were born here after 1973, because don't forget, if they're born after 1973, but before 1982, yes. then they're British anyway. So um, people born after uh, and it, well, it's quite complicated because your parents have to be married. And, but basically, people who were born here who are not automatically British, if their parents hadn't regularised their own status, so the parent's status is not regularised, then it's very difficult for the child to rely on the parent's status, which is not regularised. So I can imagine a possibility that a child whose parent is from the Windrush could have been removed. Mm. That I can see. Because um, they wouldn't, and it, it would depend on the relationship with the parent, 
Um, and if the parent hadn't regularised their status and couldn't prove it, how would the child prove it? So that is a possibility. And, and what you said as well is, um, so far, 4,200 records have been reviewed out of nearly 8,000, which date back to 2002, and no cases have been identified with breach, the protection granted under the 1971 Act. So what she said is that, and what you know, the 1971 Immigration Act provides protection for this group if they have lived here for more than five years, if they arrived in the country before 1973. Someone, someone on Instagram said, we need to move out ASAP. <laughs> It is the Enoch, the Enoch Powell ideology, right? <laughs> the conservative government is a far right government and stuff like that, you know? Um, well, they certainly give me that impression. It's difficult <laughs> to uh, defend that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but anyhow, um, so, so, you know, she claimed that the current problem facing Windrush were caused by decisions taken by successive governments going back nearly 40 years, um, you know, what do you take? Of course, we dealt with that before. It was successive governments, but um, under the present government, it has been um, hostile. Is that a fair yeah. assessment? Yeah, because previously, um, people used to work without papers. I think even Baroness Scotland had somebody working for her, cleaning her home, who didn't I have remember papers. that. The yes. Yes. Mini scandal. Yes, yeah, 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 it was. Um, now she would have been fined and, you know, all sorts, because that's what the law provides for. Um, so basically, it's successive governments who have created a, a sort of wave of anti-immigration. But if we can enable the buck to stop with the 2014 Immigration Act and undo all the requirements and penalties within that act, then we can go a long way to just going back to a fairer society. I think that act, all commentators agree, it, it's just too much um, and too harsh. And mm. whereas people may or may not understand what Theresa May was trying to achieve, um, it's just really not the way a British society should operate. It, and, and now the public have spoken because we've seen what this act has created um, and, and people don't want it. There's no call for it. Yes, um, yes, yes. But isn't it interesting, Rachel, that while it is deemed that the British society is institutionally racist or racist, but the raft of support and annoyance and indig the indig indignation, whatever, has been coming from British people, white British people? Um... Is it? Would you say so? Or are, are some of the key players in the media actually being trumping this or is it because it is the new thing in town the, the, the latest fad uh, which is in the news it's 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 a bit of that and we'll see whether that's what's gonna you know whether we'll be talking about something else next week because we've had a few fads going along um yeah. the media have been superb in um keeping on at this story it may be media that's not supportive of the government but i think that's all um that's all well and good. That's what's required. A country has to have an opposition, whether it's a media opposition or an actual opposition in government. And so the media have really, you know, turned the screws in on this and, and found people who, you know, repeated stories and stories and stories to the point that Britain has had to say, we can't have this in, in our country. This can't be happening to people and particularly people who are legally here. Yeah. So... Um, I don't think it's necessarily white British people who've been appalled. I think everybody has, has been appalled by this. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, um, what, what, what is your sort of last words or, or so to persons who may be in, in regards to this? As, how do you see the way forward? Where do you see the UK if they grab hold of some of these measures and pressure is put in now and don't sort of relent? Where do you see the UK Home Office in five years' time? Oh, that's a good question. I wasn't expecting that one. A very good question because, um, yeah, we really, you know, um, we it has to change. I mean, they change from the UK border agency. They no longer use capita. Um, you know, there's many changes. But I think, yeah, in five years' time, it has to be the Home Office in terms of 
and even when you say we've got knife crime issues as well, so violence in the, in the streets as well, yeah. and the immigration. So it looks like the Home Office is going to have to become a different beast to what it's been, um, allowed to sort of um, have perhaps have people in charge who haven't got a firm grasp of the issues. Um, and that's one of the main things that has to happen. They have to ensure that people who are in charge, because the Home Office is a very important um, department, and they have to ensure that whoever is in charge of that department, not taking anything particularly from Amber Rudd, but I think she hasn't, if she has, she hasn't shown her best part, if she's got something more there to offer, I don't think so she's released that yet. She needs to get that out very quickly. Yeah. Um, so really the Home Office has to have people in charge of it who are on the ball, who understand what's going on. And so this sort of thing can't happen under their watch. It shouldn't be happening. It's a simple thing that could be, have been well avoided if somebody had taken the reins a lot sooner. And, and one of the points you mentioned about the Home Office has got to be very sharp is because the knife crime that's under the watch, even though it, it may be the, the, um, the mayor of London, but it's really the Home Office, really. The Home Office, yeah. Home so office, home. The immigration bit is a home office so they um they're really in the news at this time rachel yes exactly yeah and that's why the question of what is it going to be in five years time um is 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 going to have to change you know the home office is how it operates is going to have to change and certainly how it operates around immigration if we allow this opportunity to pass then it will be gone for good the home office in terms of immigration has got to change yes and Rachel, how can people get hold of you now and um, your services? Tell us about your service, because uh, as I said, I've got a few people who have messaged me. So, um, yeah. tell me your service. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we deal with um, complex. What, what, what's the name of your your company? Rogol Rogol Solicitors. R O G O L S. Yes. We're on Facebook, we're Rogol's Immigration Experts. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm putting a link inside as we speak, yes. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, and we deal with complex immigration cases which primarily concern family life and um, human rights cases. Um, we deal with entry clearance as well for people. And most of our cases are Caribbean. We have a specialism really in Caribbean um, cases as well. Um, so we offer assessments for people before, um, as long as they haven't got lots of papers in the Home Office, just to find out whether they have a case, because the rules are so cut and dry these days that it's very easy to ascertain whether somebody has a case or not. So we offer an assessment and you can contact us on 0121 3894 Yes, yes. Um, so on Facebook is Rogel's Immigration Experts. I, I, I'm putting that, and you're based in Birmingham, isn't it? But you go global. So we're based in Birmingham, but we've got clients from all over, actually, well, all over the world because we're immigration, but certainly we have clients up and down the UK. Right, right, right. Okay, fantastic. I want to read this bit here, which was a closing remark by the Home Secretary. Uh, she paid tribute to the contribution of the Windrush generation. From the late 1940s to the early 1970s, many people came to this country from around the Commonwealth to make their lives here and help rebuild Britain after the war. All members of this house will have seen the recent heartbreaking stories of individuals who have been in this country for decades, struggling to navigate an immigration system in a way they never ever should have been. These people work here for decades. In many cases, they helped establish the National Health Service. They paid their taxes, enriched our culture. They are British in all but legal status, and this should never have been allowed to happen. Both the Prime Minister and I have apologized to these, those affected, and I'm personally committed to resolving the situation with urgency and purpose. Well, again, you know, I just can't understand, since she so readily has seems to have no explanation at all to how this has happened, um, you know, she really has to be mindful that people will will need an explanation. It's fair enough to be sorry, but if you're so sorry that you, and you, you need to give, how did this happen? And how can we be sure this isn't going to happen again? And that's the key part that um, in terms of her saying these people are British, but in all but legal status, that's the whole point. So yeah. that's something that doesn't even need to be said. That's just muddying the waters all over again. Yeah. The people are either British or they're not British. You know, they're Rachel, actually, you know Rachel, Rachel, one, one of the things, I, I tend to have this view, not for people to resign immediately. 
I tend to have this view that they need to clean up. Yeah, absolutely, I think so too. Yeah. I don't think she should resign. Yeah. No, I don't think she should resign. She needs yeah. to sort it out and stay yes. in position. Because, yeah. because most times things happen, our heads must roll. And I said, no, let them sort it out. <laughs> let them sort it out. I believe that's very important for, for this thing to be sorted out. Because, um, because by sort, you see, when you get someone in, a new person in, people say, ha, ah, relax. And then by virtue of such, then the pressure might be off. But with this pressure on Amber Rudd and the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister now, they will have no choice but to mm. sort it out. And that's what that's my view. Just like with Grenfell and all those sort of things. We're quick to go for the head and, and chop off the head. And then when that happens, somehow the issue tend to slip away as well. Yeah, I mean, you might, you make a very valid point, and, and it's an even better point, because Theresa Bay, who started it all, is a Prime Minister, and Amber Rudd, who's continued, is still the Home Secretary. So between the two of them, as you say, the pressure is really on for them to... They must be saying, you know, we have created this mess, whatever they're saying in public, we've created this mess, and we've got to um, get it sorted. So I don't think... when I, I don't think she should resign, yes. but I think she definitely has to get herself up to speed on the issues and provide some kind of explanation why this has happened, um, how she's going to ensure it's not going to happen again, what she's going to do to ensure that other people who are not just Windrush generation, mm. um, whether they're Commonwealth or not Commonwealth, how they are treated in the United Kingdom, and also looking at the issue of detaining people at whim yeah. just because they haven't got their papers in order. All these things need to be looked at. I, I, I think so as well, you know. I, I think so as well, Rachel. Now, now in closing, any last word? <laughs> well, my last word is always the same whenever I talk or say anything. If you can become British at the first opportunity, even if it was 30, 50 years ago now, 40 years ago, um, do so. You know, it's really important. If you're going to make the UK your home, then you and you are eligible to become British, then you should really um, make that um, jump into British citizenship and sort all this um, quadmire out. Um, yeah. It's in your best interest. Yes, yes. That, that's awesome. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much. But let me just look to see a um, couple of the questions which were here. Um, uh, Dion Green said, wasn't that flyer done in conjunction with the Jamaican government? <laughs> I could believe that because it's not something I've seen coming from the UK. So... Um... Not sure. So but, but, is yeah. really too pale. But, but, but can I say again as well, I'm not surprised the about. Device sorry, is sorry, to go successfully. I, I'm not support. I'm not surprised still because sometimes visitors to the country tend to get these little briefing as to what to go, what we're not to go. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it does so, sound more like if you're abroad in a foreign country. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so in a way, in a way, I saw so when I heard that, I said, "Hmm, mm, mm, that's a bit funny." <laughs> hey, let's keep that one there, you know. Um, somebody said, "Well done for doing this." Dion Green said, "Will the compensation be uh, no win, no fee on the legal advice, or will government spell it clearly out the compensation?" Well, I think we we understand. I think the compensation and the win, no fee is different, isn't it? Because the fees are going to be waived, isn't it? Um, well, the no win, no fee would be if you instruct um, a solicitor. Um, yes. And yes. Imagine that most solicitors would be offering a, because the, the, the home office has already said they're going to pay the compensation, so the no win is not really, it doesn't come into it because it, the compensation will already be paid. Yeah. Um, but imagine that solicitors won't charge until the compensation has been received and probably deduct their fees from the compensation. I wouldn't imagine that they would expect people to pay up front. That would be, you know, yeah. unusual. Will the saga affect the conservative vote from the ethnic minority community? Well, we dealt with that already. Um, yes, it will, I think. Yeah. <laughs> One, those who are illegal and may try to jump on the Windrush bandwagon, they could be deported. <laughs> Whether you gave those words already and stuff like that. Um, okay, well, anyhow, um, Rachel, when you got time, you can go back through some of these. Uh, I posted your website. I posted your write-up there, which um, clearly set out your business, which, which I like this bit, which you said, which is... Um, we are a boutique immigration law practice situated in Birmingham's jewelry quarter. We represent people who wish to live, work, 
study, join, family, or do business in the UK. We also have expertise in advising people who are at risk of losing their lawful immigration status if there has been a change of circumstances. You will need to reassess whether you are still on the correct immigration route. There's a lot of high value information on these pages as a guide to UK immigration law. If you wish to get advice about your specific circumstance, then please book a consultation. Ladies and gentlemen, I've posted the, the website on the page and um, those who need legal advice, please delve in to speak to uh, Rachel. Um, immigration law is not my specialty. I'll just direct you across to Rachel. That's correct, Rachel. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, now is not the time to be dabbling. <laughs> yeah, yes. So listen, I want to thank you so much, Rachel, and um, thank you, yeah. and for your time. And uh, well, we did nearly two hours. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, yes, going to 48. Um, but it's wealth of information as well for persons. I mean, one of the things that I'm doing as well is to, I'm still tapping into the whole knife crime issue still because yeah. uh, two more persons got stabbed. It's now over 60, I believe. And it's just climbing. Um, but that, that's the thing with the news. You've got to be circumspect because you'll just forget one thing. Yeah. The new thing comes on, you know. Um, so there are over 26 organizations that I've listed recently that I'm actually listing them and actually getting the different persons in charge to come out of a conversation. Oh, that would be very good, yeah. yeah. About Paul Lawrence um, from... Okay. Um, Hundred black men. Yeah, I'm supposed to get um, Manhood Academy sometime okay. this week and uh, tomorrow. I think it's what, today's Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, isn't it? Today's uh, Tuesday. Yeah. Yes, Tuesday, it is yeah. Tuesday. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully Thursday, I'm supposed to get Israel from the Peace Treaty. Um, these are locked with the postcode thing. I'm hoping to get him on as mm -hmm. well and a raft of different persons, bursary and all those sort of things. Just keeping the spotlight on these um, issues as well. And then we will we will follow up on Amber Rudd and the Home Office maybe after the elections. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can answer the question. <laughs> yes, and all the best in the election for yourself as well, Amber. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining and. Uh, that was a good um, discussion with Rachel. Um, for those who are just coming on, you can watch it on the replay. And hi, Silver, we're in Birmingham. Is she based? I'd like some advice from her. Please ask her for her number. Um, Pamela, I posted the her details on the website. Her telephone number is, and I say it right now. Her telephone number is, is. Oh, where's your telephone number, Rachel? If you're there, tell her your telephone number. But anyhow, there's a website here which the full details where you can actually. Um, let me see if the web telephone number is there. Yes, the telephone number is there. 0121 389 4895. That's it. 0121-389-4895 you can contact her tomorrow and the website is here as well um, rogles.co.uk I posted it earlier let me post it again for Rachel where you can actually tap in um, here we go I believe this is important information I believe I believe I believe a lot a lot of people a lot of people will be um, wanting to get this information as much as possible so i uh, want to thank you um those on instagram land i want to thank you those on facebook land and uh thank you so much for joining me tonight uh hopefully i'll let you know for the rest of this week who is going to come on the show and uh yeah and yes, yes, I'm just checking some of the questions there people are asking. Okay, please share this video as well and let people know about it. A lot of information here um, regarding the wind rush. And, um, and have a good night and um, all the best. It is an early one tonight. Still finished at 11 o'clock. Started at good afternoon. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, have a smashing evening. 
and um and if you want me to direct you to rachel feel free to also message me as well if you're in jamaica if you've got a relative a grandmother or whatever like that and you've got issues regarding the wind rush please feel free to message me i will just direct you um to persons that i trust and uh yes thank you very much all the best have a good night instagram land thank you very much see you later for those just coming on um first lady jay um i think first lady jay we're gonna put you on the naughty steps for being late <laughs> um so all the best as well peace out cheers Yeah.